small Iowa town. Who do you think you are? A six-part series of ABC News. Tonight, a small town in Iowa. A great many people who grew up in small towns live in cities now, telling everyone how good it was back home. You wonder if maybe small towns are better to remember than they are to live in. The people who stay in small towns frequently profess a great affection for them. They wouldn't want to live in the hustle and bustle of the big city. As far as I know, Humboldt, Iowa is the best small town in the whole world. I spent some of the best times of my life here as a boy, and I am not now, naturally, disposed to view Humboldt with the same dispassionate journalistic eye with which I try to see most things. It seems to me that if the world were more like Humboldt, the world would be better. But we are going to try to take a dispassionate look at it anyway. Here is a town apparently perfect in all aspects a visitor can observe. Happy, healthy, pretty, and prosperous. A good little democracy, working the way man has always hoped his civilization might. But if a small town in Iowa is paradise, why are they trying to get the kids not to leave? Why are they trying to talk more people into coming here? Why aren't the people from the world's poor and ugly ghettos storming the castle walls to get inside this little utopia? We don't know why, but we'll show you what we do know. Maybe you can answer the question. Although sometimes the explanation for the location of a community is lost in some obscure historical incident, there's no doubt about why Humboldt is where it is. It's here because of the farms that surround it. The farmland in Humboldt County is maybe the best in all of Iowa. The farmland of Iowa, the best in the country. And the farmland of this country, as good as any in the world. That makes the farms around Humboldt pretty good farms. Humboldt, Iowa, population 4,700, is right next to Dakota City. It is 11 miles southwest of Livermore, 24 miles southeast of Algona, and 17 miles north of Fort Dodge. And that's all the help we're going to give you. Like a lot of towns in America, Humboldt has two business districts now. The newer one is out on the main road that was built to avoid the business district. You know what's out there the same thing that's out there everywhere. It's more practical than charming. But unlike the old downtown in a lot of places, downtown Humboldt is still at the heart of things. The big shopping center that has ruined business for the small old timers in so many communities hasn't been built here yet. When the farmers come to town Friday night to shop, this is where they come. There is one of almost everything in Humboldt if you need it, you can probably get it without having to send away. Of course, there's more than one of a lot of things. One of the things they don't have in Humboldt is a liquor store. If that impresses you favorably, it's only fair to tell you they don't have a bookstore either. One of the things that types you in town is which bank you go to. Doing business with Jack Campbell's Trust and Savings instead of banking at Joe Dodgen's First National is like being a Rotarian instead of a lion. The people change, and yet, like a river whose water is never the same, there is something constant about the look and attitude here, decade after decade. There is a continuity to things that is important. There is none of the artificial devotion to antiquity so prevalent in New England and the South, but things don't change much either. People seem more at ease with themselves than city people. And maybe it's because of this sense of continuity they get from living here. The one certain thing that everyone in Humboldt knows about everyone else is which church they go to. There are seven churches, and on any given Sunday morning at 11, 70% of the people are in one of them. The Adventists go on Saturday. A mixed group in Humboldt 
is a party at which there are Baptists, Congregationalists, and Catholics. There are seven churches, two of them Lutheran. There are more Methodists than anything else. There is no anti-Semitism in Humboldt, but there are no Jews either. The social system is based on the churches, but of course there are times when they all get together, like at the annual Isaac Walton fish fry. Because of price, they've had to switch from baby pike from Minnesota to commercial cod from Boston. But even though one box of fish got left out in the sun a few years ago, the feed is always a big success. Well, for heaven's sakes, what do you got here? Those beans are delicious. Hi, Larry. Right Hi, Glenn. A portion of the meal? Got something around. The men put on the feed to raise money to send some boys to camp. You can only hope the boys eat this well at the camp. Kids haven't learned to treasure nice days yet, and no matter how nice a day Saturday is, most of the kids go to the movie house, known simply as the show. You going to the show? How old are you? What? How old are you? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let... Thank you. Uh, you're 12, aren't you? Are you 12? 10. And no one goes in empty-handed. How much are my savers? Very dime. Uh, Mom and Joy. Mom and Joy. I want some juicy fruit. Thank you. No one in Humboldt thought we were taking pictures of any typical activity in town, That's right. except when we were taking pictures of them. The girls meet twice a week in Marjorie Davenport's basement to make quilts. They sell them to raise money for the Humboldt Historical Society. There's a trick to, to uh, threading this, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Did you have another uh, dining needle, uh, Mabel? Oh, then go on this side. And then we go on this side, don't we? Because we go here. We go on the white side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 There's too many layers, too, layers of goods in it. Too well, Heather, you can teach us how to spin. <laughs> On that practice. spinning wheel? <laughs> I have to practice. I don't know, the fingers and thumbs. Or thumbs and fingers. Right here. That's where you put your... Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then up here. Well, that's what you've done. How many have we done all together? I think you've done eight for me. 102. We've done 102. Yes. In case you thought it was all quilting going on in Humboldt. Otto Schultz runs the Star Ballroom, and Otto doesn't raise money for anyone but himself. Some of the kids in Humboldt don't approve of the Star, but it attracts a crowd from all over. Humboldt isn't what you'd call a swinging town, though. There's one all-purpose restaurant and hotspot, also called the Star. If you want a motel room without waking the owners, you should get there by 11. There aren't many lights left on after 11. You see pictures of so many fields of waving corn from Iowa in summer, you forget it looks this way for longer than it looks that way. You wonder what they played with before they had these. The best place for snowmobiling is down on the river between the Joe Reasoner Dam and the Country Club. If the meeting will now come to order, we'll have the roll call by the city clerk, Dick Ake. 
When we were there, the city council was wrestling with a law permitting snowmobiles to use town streets. In the city, a citizen knows he is somehow affected by a new law, but he often has a hard time relating it to any of his real problems. It's different in a small town. There is a close relationship between the realities of life and government. Now we come to the snowmobile ordinance, which our city clerk has gone over. I think most of you are quite familiar with the ordinance. Our city attorney has a bout with the flu and said that we had two or three different ways that we could go on this ordinance. Personally, I don't believe we should waive the uh, three readings. Well, I mean, this is up to you people. I don't, uh, I don't know why you want to. Well, it's going to make us awfully late in coming back with an ordinance that these people have asked for very patiently. Well, I was just going by people other than the snowmobilers who uh, aren't a little bit anxious that it be passed. Well, I mean, this, uh, of course, they aren't very happy the way it is now either, Ralph. There's no controls at all now. Well, we do have state laws governing the use right. of snowmobiles, and if we can't enforce that, we certainly aren't going to be able to enforce the... I think order. we will, with the help of the snowmobilers. I think we will. I really do. I think they've got enough faith in them. And then, the thing that worries everyone who worries about anything at all is the thought that our society is disintegrating. Nothing seems to work very well, especially the way we govern ourselves. In a small town, it seems to work. Motion carried. things you find as a reporter is that typical is harder to find than unusual. We picked Humboldt partly because we thought it was typical, but of course we know it isn't really. It's a lot better than typical. We wanted to show you the inside of a typical Humboldt house, and the one we picked is better than typical too. My grandparents built this house when they quit farming and moved to town. If you were a farmer, this house in town represents the dream that got you up mornings at 5.30 all your life. The Dykes live there now, but it doesn't look much different from when I spent my summers in it. The dining room is always ready, but we never ate in it much, and you can tell the Dykes don't either. The sturdy stained oak cupboard holds the good dishes everyone owns, but seldom uses. Where you eat in Humboldt is in the kitchen, mostly. Or, if you're lucky, like the Dykes, here in this sunroom just off the kitchen. Most of the money that's been spent on the house since I knew it, aside from basic maintenance, is where most of the money is spent in most houses, the kitchen. Bathrooms don't seem to change. Like most Americans these days, people in Humboldt live in front of their television sets. I guess you'd call this the family room. They read the magazines that sell eight million copies, and they watch the shows that are in the top 10. Nixon's picture hangs here, not because he's Nixon, 
but because he is president of the Dykes country. The thing anyone from outside would notice most about Humboldt, though, would not be its houses, but its children. You get thinking all the world's children are hungry or poor or emotionally disturbed, and then it is touching to see here how it is children ought to be able to live. There's something isolated about an island town like this, surrounded by farmland. They have television and radio and a good local newspaper twice a week. But if they do know what goes on in the world, distance protects them from caring. Evenings, the television announcer introduces the local news by saying, now stay tuned for news, sports, and weather. First, the weather. First things first. The small farms around Humboldt are disappearing, but Humboldt is not a dying town. There are lots of places twice its size with half its industry. There's a lot of it in town, and much of the civic effort of its business leaders is devoted to attracting more industry to come here. It seems strange to anyone living in an area that has been ruined by too much industry that these men would spend so much of their time doing something that will certainly make Humboldt more like all the places they say they would not want to live in. You wonder if they know what they've got here, but then you realize they must know. After all, they're the ones who chose to stay here. Doc Lynn, for instance, he chose to stay here. There are four doctors and seven veterinarians in Humboldt, and he could work anywhere he wanted and probably make more money. But he likes the life here. You wait around in the Nura and wrestle with these people's problems and you get to know them, he says. We followed him on his rounds one day, and frankly, we prefer broadcasting. Doc Lynn has a great collection of barbed wire, and last year he scared his wife half to death when they went to Germany. It seems he got her to engage the guard in conversation while he snipped a foot-long piece of barbed wire out of the Berlin Wall to add to his collection. In addition to pride, Humboldt has something else not exceeded anywhere else in the world, an egg factory. In these eight sheds, each the size of three football fields, 650,000 little white leghorn egg makers each lay about 250 eggs a year. It must be one of the most efficient production plants that ever operated. Although there is something outrageous in man's having put the hen's biological urge to reproduce to such a commercial end. Every little while, when the hen's enthusiasm for laying begins to flag, Campbell's soup moves in and takes 80,000 chickens at one time. Having gotten to know these chickens, we couldn't bear to ask what they do with them. Having a pony is something out of a book to most kids. In Humboldt, there are kids who actually have them. The kids may have real worries, like kids always have, but they're not concerned about being attacked on the way home from school. A crime wave in Humboldt is the Saturday night Chief Lockwood catches a kid at the dance with a can of beer. There is a busing problem in Humboldt. The problem is getting the buses over from the high school to pick up the kids at the grade school without tying up traffic too long on Taft Street. The only real minority in Humboldt is the Democrats. There are no black people. The ritual of the game of the season is performed several times a week, and everyone knows how the teams are doing. The glass cases in the halls of the high school are filled with evidence of past prowess. The boys play, the girls are proud. Women's Lib is a ways down the road. We attended a special class that was conducted seminar style by a teacher who led discussions of just about anything. For us, they talked about Humboldt. We got more... 
<laughs> raging waterfalls and the broken Dakota City Dam than the North Platte <laughs> River does. <laughs> Iowa's an exciting state. That's why Compared everybody wants to get out of it, I guess. It's a nice place to, you know, grow up, but not to, to live in. I think it'd be a good yeah. place to bring your family. I mean, this yeah. is the kind of town that I'd like to have family and grow up, you know, grow up here. But I want to do something more with my life and get out of here, and I don't want to live here all my life. You know, if you want to become something or go to school or something, you about have to go to a big city. Up until about two years ago, this was a fine place for me to live because my interests were just in living and having fun and growing up. But now as I'm getting older and going to college and want to get out in the world, it's no longer the place for me to live. That's why I'm going to leave. I think a lot like Bill, you know, because um, after you've been here for a while, you know, you see everything that's here and everything that's old. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that, that's good, but there's also, it shades you from the world a lot, too. You never find out, you know, really what's going on. There doesn't seem to be a challenge here that I, the piece of the challenge that I want. Like myself, I want to go on to be as much as I possibly can. And Humboldt isn't the kind of town you can do this in. But other people are looking for family life and peace and have some place for their kids to play. And this is the kind of place that they, they can get that. Personally, I know one of the things that bother me about Humboldt is, is that maybe I prefer the impersonal aspect of a larger city, but it seems like in Humboldt, things, too many people know about you, and they, they restrict you in that way by, by the things they know about you. They limit you. We have a pretty high moral standard. I'm not yeah. saying that the cities are outside of Iowa has a low moral standard or anything, I don't know. but. I think there's a pretty high moral standard in Humboldt. One of my older brothers who you know, teaches, he uh, sent his federal income tax or something, something back to the government, postage due. And that, you know, it bothered Dad. Uh, the old trick of calling home to, you know, you get out, you know, you get back to Pittsburgh or something like that, and you call back and say, you know, is Ronald Stone there? And uh, you know, that, that's the guy that's calling, and that bothers Dad, too, so that, uh, you know, that he doesn't want them to do that. It's just that type of thing that, uh, you know, they have a high ethic, moral value, I think, especially in the older people. What is it about paradise that's turning the bright kids off? We're all agreed that our aim is to live with as much happiness and as little unhappiness as possible. That ought to be easier in a small town. We're agreed that one of the first joys of life is the approval we get from others and the sense of fellow feeling we have with our friends. That ought to be easier in a small town. Most of us are ill at ease about the end of life. People in small towns have the comfort, at least, of knowing they won't be leaving home. What seems to be missing is more a shortcoming of ours than of the small town. It is that those of us with ego and ambition are not usually happy performing in front of an audience the size a small town provides. It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a My grandparents had seven children. Those seven, in turn, produced eight. Of the seven of those eight now living, only one lives in Humboldt. She was always the smart one.
Well, that's Humboldt. I'm Harry Reasoner. It's nice to know where you came from.